No, we don't need to hear that song again. We really don't need to hear that song again. It's a great song. <laughs> but we're just going to let it go. Folks, we're standing by for uh, some live footage from SLC 41. You've got Starliner that's supposed to be going tomorrow. Uh, can you hear me today? Hopefully I've turned on my microphone here and you can actually hear what I'm saying. Uh, I'm Das. I'm the studio host. We've got Chris Gebhardt who is currently setting up a remote or setting up a camera uh, out at SLC 41 for some live views of Starliner. Now, Starliner has a launch tomorrow morning. It's the OFT. What does that mean? That's the orbital flight test. Right? I have it up on the screen behind me here, right? The orbital flight test for Starliner. Uh, Starliner, of course, one of the commercial crew capsules that will be taking. What did Bridenstine say? this morning uh american astronauts to space from american soil on american rockets hey i'm just repeating what he said this morning right so uh that is what starliner is going to be launching it's launching launching on an atlas n22 isn't it chat correct me um if i'm wrong but i think it's an atlas n22 which stands for a no fairing because it's got starliner on top and uh, it's got two srbs and it's got two centaurs in the upper stage now this is going to be the first time that Send the two stage, the two centaur 
uh, or the two engine upper stage actually um, has launched on an Atlas V, I believe, ever with the RD-180s on the bottom. You're right, there are RD-180s on the bottom. But again, we are just standing by right now. Chris Gebhardt is down there at SOC 41. He's getting ready to he set up the cameras. I think the cameras are already online. Uh, we're just waiting till he gets into a position where he would be allowed to turn on the feed right now. This is something that's super important. We we have the ability to bring some of these live streams to you from Cape Canaveral or where wherever else we end up. Uh, but when we're there, we do have to follow rules. It's not just willy-nilly pointing cameras all over the place and let's film everything. Uh, we do have to put the cameras in specific positions and point them at certain things and, and stick to what we're basically there to see. And today, we're there to see SLC-41 and Starliner on top of the uh, United Launch Alliance Atlas rocket. So. What we were doing before, if you remember some of our previous streams, we do these Q&As. We'll get Chris online with his camera, and we'll start doing some Q&A. It's going to be Chris talking, not me. I'm just here to, like, fill space until the camera comes online, right? But if you have a question for us, you can put it into tw in, into chat over here, right? I've got chat up, and when I'm not on the camera here running my mouth, uh, I will be relaying some, que some questions to Chris Gebhardt, and he can answer the questions live. And the coolest thing about this is, while we've got a let camera live at the pad, we can zoom in on different features of the rocket. So if you have a question about the crew access arm, you can ask a question about the crew access arm, and not only can we answer your question, we can actually use the camera to zoom in. And I just got a report from Chris here saying that he was ready to go. So let's see if we can get Chris's camera online. I'm going to see if we can get his video, make sure that everything's good, and we are going to swap over to Chris's camera. Let me tell him. I'm juggling a lot of stuff here, but let me tell him. Okay, spooling up. Confirm rate. I'm literally telling Chris in messages right now to make sure that it's working. Uh, let's see if we can get this camera online, and shortly we should have a live view with Q&A from Chris Gebhardt at SLC 41 down at Cape Canaveral next to Starliner. Uh, working a little bit of a technical issue, but we're just looking on the camera right now. Let's see if we can push this over. I do believe we're getting bitrate from him. Let's cut to Chris's camera and see what we get from Chris at Cape Canaveral right now. And alive. Mic check, mic check. Mic check, mic check. Mic check, mic check. And good afternoon and welcome to the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station where we are looking at the Atlas V rocket with Starliner on top of it. I'm Chris Gebhardt, the Assistant Managing Editor of NASA Spaceflight and uh, we will be here for um, hopefully the next hour if the schedule holds, uh, taking your questions about this amazing mission from United Launch Alliance Boeing and NASA testing the Starliner crew capsule in an uncrewed test flight configuration up to the International Space Station. If you have questions, go ahead and throw them up in the chat here uh, of this YouTube stream and our producer will go ahead and get them on over to me. Um, any and all questions you've got about the Atlas V, about the Starliner, about the commercial crew program in general, um, we will go ahead and answer that. And as we are waiting for some of those questions to start to come in, let's go ahead and start with an overview of the Atlas rocket. So this is a nice wide zoom. You can see we are standing actually right in front of the flame trench where all of that heat and exhaust and debris will come rushing out 
right at liftoff um, as the RD-180 engine and the twin solid rocket boosters ignite to take Starliner onward to orbit. So let us start our tour of the rocket at the tippity top because that's where the business end of this rocket really is. Normally we like to say that the business end of the rocket is the part with all of the engines, but uh, Starliner is first and foremost uh, the star of our show tomorrow morning and for the next week. So this is the uncrewed orbital flight test for Starliner. Um, like SpaceX's Dragon capsule in March of this year, it is mandated to conduct an uncrewed test flight first to verify all of its systems and the integrated performance of the crew capsule, its service module, and the rocket it's and the rocket itself. It will also verify that Starliner can uh, perform as designed on orbit, both the crew module and the service module. That it can uh, automa automated in an automated fashion dock to the International Space Station without any crew input, and then safely undock from the International Space Station and re-enter and land. Um, so. The top part that you see here, you see the big white box over to the right hand side on a big metal arm that says ULA and has the US flag on it. That is the Caraxes arm. So tomorrow morning, while crew will not be boarding Starliner, um, the blue team, which is what Boeing and United Launch Alliance are calling the team that comes back out to the pad to assist astronauts with boarding Starliner, they will come out uh, after the Atlas V is fully fueled. Uh, they will come out to the pad about three hours before liftoff, so 3.36 a.m. Eastern Time um, or uh, 8.36 UTC Time. They will open up Starliner's hatch with a fully fueled Atlas V rocket beneath them. They'll make sure that Starliner is configured for flight and they'll do some change outs of some filters of its environmental control systems just like they would do on launch day. The only thing that will be different from a blue team perspective is the fact that there are no crew to put on board. The, um, the test flight dummy called Rosie is already on in her seat and safely strapped inside so they won't have to do anything there. Um, that crew access arm will pull away about 10 minutes before liftoff and then we will be in the business end of the countdown for launch. So right next to that crew access arm, the gray and blue sh conical shaped structure is the Starliner crew module where the crew will reside and live after they board the rocket and the capsule for flight and on their six to 12 hour journey to the International Space Station. Starliner and the Atlas V are built so that for crew flights they can reach the station within 6 to 12 hours under nominal flight conditions, but they can also take up to a day or two in a pinch to rendezvous with the International Space Station depending on exactly where the station is at the time that Starliner were to launch on its crew flights. So coming slightly down the rocket, right below that um, grayish blue conical Starliner crew module, you see another white band that has some ribbing on it. It has a little black band around it as well. That is Starliner service module where the majority of the reaction control system thrusters reside. It's also where all 12 orbital maneuvering and attitude control thrusters, which Boeing um, puts into an acronym called OMAC. It's where all of those are. And it's also, you can't see it because it's hidden underneath but it is also where the four launch abort engines are and where all of the solar panels are mounted to the underside to provide for power and battery charging once on orbit. Uh, directly below that, you can uh, see there's another white ring that then ends very abruptly. Uh, that is the new aero skirt for the Atlas V rocket. So because the Atlas V is not flying with a payload fairing, uh, and the way that Starliner is designed, it actually creates an unstable airflow if they did not have that uh, aeroskirt below it. And that unstable airflow could really mess up the Atlas V's ability to stay on track as it's launching through the dense lower atmosphere. So that aeroskirt is attached up there, and shortly after the dual engine Centaur ignites about five minutes, just after five minutes of the flight, that aeroskirt will separate because it's no longer needed. As we continue coming down, 
The next big white uh, column is the dual engine Centaur upper stage. Uh, that is the part of the rocket that will burn for the longest amount of time from uh, about 4 minutes and 45 seconds into flight until 11 minutes 54 minutes uh, seconds into flight. So a very long burn of the dual engine Centaur upper stage to get Starliner into its suborbital injection trajectory and get it on its way to the International Space Station. We'll talk a little bit more about why Starliner's trajectory is suborbital when the Atlas completes the launch phase uh, in just a little bit. Uh, that, uh, that is then the uh, adapter between the Atlas V booster and the Centaur upper stage, also known as the inner stage. And then we have the long golden Atlas V core stage. You can see the twin solid rocket boosters built by Aerojet Rocketdyne there, flanking both sides of that tank. Uh, you can see uh, over to the left-hand side between the gold Atlas V booster and the white solid rocket booster, you can see another little gold uh, pipe that pops out from the side of the Atlas. That is the liquid oxygen feed line, which brings the liquid oxygen from the tank in the Atlas V down to the engines. And you can't see the engines from here, but what you can see is the flame trench, where all of that exhaust will come rushing out of at liftoff. And of course, next to the Atlas there is the crew tower, uh, the crew access tower, where the crew on uh, crewed missions of Starliner will board an elevator and go up to the top to walk across the crew access arm and board Starliner. Uh, and it's also where, uh, if they needed to evacuate Starliner very quickly uh, before that crew access arm pulled away, they could get out of there and run to the emergency escape slide wire system and slide down and away to safety. Um, this is a working launch pad, so we're going to get things like that with vans and uh, vehicles coming by uh, because we are getting very, very close to launch. Uh, so before we talk a little bit about the suborbital trajectory, let's take a few of your questions uh, that you've been sending in. So we have our first question is, do they do a static fire for the Atlas before launch? An excellent question. So they do a version of the static fire. So what that question is referring to is... Um, for those of us very familiar with the SpaceX Falcon 9 rockets, SpaceX will completely fuel a Falcon 9 and actually light the engines on the launch pad for three to seven seconds, known as a static fire test. Um, United Launch Alliance and uh, the Starliner Boeing team did not do a static fire test, but what they did was everything but light the engines. So um, back on uh, December 6th, they actually fueled up the Atlas and the Centaur completely, ran through an entire launch day just as it will be tomorrow morning when they go to launch, and they took the countdown all the way down to a simulated engine start, uh, but they did not actually light the RD-180 engine. Uh, and that gave them all of the data that they needed to make sure that the Atlas' systems were functioning properly uh, and gave them the opportunity to find any suspect components and swap them out without delaying the mission. Uh, another question that we have is, are they planning to do an in-flight abort with Starliner? Another excellent question. Uh, the answer to that is no. Um, unlike the Crew Dragon and SpaceX, which will do its in-flight abort test uh, now no earlier than the 11th of January, uh, Starliner will not do an in-flight abort test. And this is because that NASA's commercial crew program did not actually mandate that either of the commercial crew providers do an in-flight abort. NASA was very clear that they would allow in-flight abort certification to be gained using computer modeling. Um, but SpaceX decided to add an in-flight abort on their own. Boeing opted for the uh, computer analysis certification for in-flight abort for Starliner. Um, so there will not be an in-flight abort before the crew test flight sometime next year. Um, oh, and we do have a question. Why is the orbital flight test suborbital when the Atlas drops it off? So that's a great question. So let's go ahead and talk about that right now. Um, there's been quite a bit of speculation online uh, about this, but I actually got to speak with... Um, uh, with the Starliner and Atlas V mission manager for United Launch Alliance earlier today, and we talked a lot about the suborbital trajectory. Uh, so here's the bottom line of it. The Atlas V with the dual engine Centaur upper stage is capable of getting Starliner all the way into orbit. Starliner is the heaviest payload that the Atlas V has ever launched. Um, 
but the question remained if the Atlas V is actually capable of getting it all the way to orbit, why is it not actually going into a full orbit? Why is it going to be suborbital when it pops off the top of the Atlas 15 minutes into flight? And the answer to that is Boeing actually asked for a almost in orbit but still suborbital uh, trajectory at drop off because if everything goes perfectly and Atlas and Centaur get Starliner to its suborbital drop off period, Starliner's service module is still carrying all of the propellant that would have been used for an in flight abort, to, used by those launch abort engines, which we can't see because they're hidden in its stack configuration. And Boeing would like to get rid of all of that fuel in Starliner and lighten up Starliner's mass before they use its thrusters and maneuvering engines to raise its orbit and actually rendezvous with the International Space Station. So Boeing requested a suborbital insertion trajectory so that they can then do what's known as the orbit insertion burn and use all of that launch abort propellant that's saved in the event of a launch abort and burn it in an efficient way to get Starliner the rest of the way into orbit and get rid of that mass and fuel that they don't actually need. So a very important piece of that puzzle answer today, Atlas V and Centaur can get Starliner all the way to orbit, but Boeing actually requested the suborbital trajectory so they can burn off the propellant that they don't need. Now, a benefit to United Launch Alliance with this is it's actually a little more efficient on the Centaur dual engine stage to insert Starliner into a suborbital trajectory. Uh, and then also, Centaur is in a suborbital trajectory, so they don't then need to fire up the engines again on Centaur to do a deorbit burn to get that stage down and dispose of it safely. So it worked out well that Boeing requested that, but um, really wanted to dispel the myth that the Atlas isn't powerful enough to get Starliner into orbit. It is the trajectory which is requested by Boeing. So that is the answer to why orbital flight test is suborbital and uh, as will all of the crew missions as well. That is not a unique profile just for the orbital flight test, the crew flight test and all of the regular uh, crew rotation missions will also be suborbital uh, when Atlas drops Starliner off in its initial orbit. Um, and it should be noted too that for Boeing, um, this, this suborbital drop off trajectory is very familiar to them. Uh, all 134 space shuttle missions that reached orbit will, were suborbital at orbit insertion when their engines cut off. Um, and then the shuttle orbiters would separate from their external tank. And then about 32 minutes after liftoff, they would fire their orbital maneuvering system engines to do the orbit and to finish the orbit insertion. Um, so very familiar to Boeing, very familiar to NASA to do that type of launch trajectory. It's just a little weird because we've never seen that from United Launch Alliance before. But um, again, really wanted to dispel that myth that Atlas isn't powerful enough to do it. It is, and it could. Boeing just requested that they not take them all the way to orbit. So um, next question that we've got here is why do we need two crew spacecraft? Why not just fly one from one rocket company? Uh, an excellent question. That's definitely what NASA did from the early 1960s to 2011. They had one human spaceflight program at a time from Mercury and then Gemini and then Apollo and then the space shuttle. Um, but uh, one of the things that NASA learned in the shuttle program was that it's very important to have redundancy in your human spaceflight systems, especially when those systems are critical to supporting the International Space Station. Um, we have been, knock on wood, very, very lucky that the Soyuz's only major incident resulted in the safe recovery of the two crew members on the MS-10 abort flight, and that Roscosmos was able to very quickly return the Soyuz vehicles to launch uh, and into service because the Soyuzes are currently our only way of getting humans to the International Space Station. Um, but for NASA and uh, the way that the commercial crew program will help the International Space Station uh, increase its crew size from six to seven, with four people going on each of the U.S.-based um, crew rotation flights, whether they be Starliner or Dragon. Um, having two systems was very important to NASA. If one system goes down for some reason, you still have the other one that can pick up that slack. Um, 
and while Boeing and SpaceX are only slated to fly once a year, um, two U.S. crew rotation flights a year, but Starliner doing one of those and Dragon doing the other, um, Dragon and Starliner can kind of act as backups for each other. So if something should happen to one, the other one could pick up that slack and continue uh, to allow the U.S. to have um, assured access to the International Space Station. So that's why we went with two instead of one. Um, let's see, what other questions do we have here? Um, is this the first time the Atlas V is flying with a reusable spacecraft? Excellent question, and the answer is yes. This is the first time that a United Launch Alliance vehicle is flying... Oh, I'm sorry, the answer is no. I'm sorry, the answer is no. Um, this is not the first time that um, the Atlas V or United Launch Alliance is flying with a reusable rocket. Um, the other reusable rocket that the Atlases have launched also come from Boeing, and that is the X-37B space plane or mini space shuttle um, that the U.S. Air Force uses for secret operations. Um, the Atlas V has launched all but one of those um, X-37B missions. Uh, so Starliner is the second reusable spacecraft that will be launched by an Atlas rocket and by United Launch Alliance. Um, another question, if we run out of RD-180 engines, will Starliner fly on Vulcan? That is another excellent question. So for a bit of context before I give that answer, the gold Atlas V booster that the two solid rocket boosters are mounted to, um, that rocket is powered by a single RD-180 engine, and the RD-180 is built by Russia. Um, and the U.S. government doesn't want to pay Russia for Russian engines on American rockets. Um, so there's been some finagling back and forth with Congress and this and that. Um, and as a result, United Launch Alliance is developing the Vulcan rocket, which will use Blue Origin made engines to power its first stage. Uh, but for the Atlas V, um, they're doing some trade-off studies as to whether or not they wish to change from the RD-180 um, onto um, Blue Origin engines. Um, haven't heard a lot about that recently, but Starliner in particular was built specifically to be launch vehicle agnostic, meaning it can launch on an Atlas V, it can launch on a Vulcan rocket, it can launch on a Delta IV rocket, and it can even launch on the Falcon 9 rocket. Um, so if, so Boeing very purposefully made their capsule capable of launching on multiple vehicles, not just for the, um, uncertainty in the RD-180 that that whole quandary of what to do came after Boeing began designing, um, Starliner. So from the start, Boeing very much wanted, uh, to be able to launch on any, a particular rocket. The the tricky part to that would honestly be uh, the crew access arm, which is very dedicated and specific to Starliner. You can't just stick Starliner on top of a Falcon 9 and haul it out to pad 39A and use that crew access arm because the heights of the vehicles are different from each other. Um, so you'd have some issues there. But the larger part of that equation is that, yes, with enough lead time, they can switch Starliner to another vehicle. Um, so a very, very excellent question there. Um, although to answer your specific question, if we went out of RD-180s, will Starliner fly on Vulcan? The answer is yes. Um, but uh, that calculation isn't just from the RD-180 main engine perspective. Uh, and coming across, we have a, a minor celebrity. There goes John Krause. Uh, <laughs> as I said, a working spaceport. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, next question we've got, um, what tests will they be doing before they get to the International Space Station? Right, so the test, after the Starliner actually launches and pops off the top of the, uh, of the Atlas, uh, of the Atlas V and the Centaur, um, it will first coast up to the highest point of its orbit, which is 180, or so it's uh, the highest point of its suborbital trajectory, which is 181 kilometers above Earth's sea level. At that point, it will fire its OMAC, four of its 12 OMAC engines to perform the orbit insertion burn. That burn will last for 40 seconds. It starts 31 minutes after liftoff and ends 31 minutes, 40 seconds after liftoff. And five seconds after that burn is complete, Starliner starts its on-orbit demonstrations immediately. So um, 
it starts its test sequence immediately after it inserts itself into orbit. The main things that they are going to be doing are integrated system performances, making sure that Starliner and the service module are talking to each other as designed and firing all the thrusters and that everything is working and its power and propulsion systems and environmental systems are all working as it should be. Um, the other major objectives that they're going to be doing are actually after it undocks from the International Space Station, which is making sure that Starliner and the service module can separate cleanly and as desired for atmospheric entry. Starliner's heat shield is actually underneath and protected by the service module when it's in orbit, but you have to separate that service module to expose the heat shield to survive re-entry. Um, other on-orbit things that they are wanting to do to test with Starliner are its, ability, is, are its ability to safely and autonomously approach, rendezvous, and dock with the International Space Station, testing all of those automated systems, including its radars, its lidars, its visual cameras, everything that it uses to perform that automated docking. Under ideal circumstances, even with crew, Starliner will do everything for the crew. Uh, and, and the crew don't have to interact with it um, all that much, but there's but the crew on board would have the ability to take manual control if they so desired. Um, another major test is um, actually coming from Rosie um, on board the the test dummy that is on board Starliner. Um, uh, that is equipped with sensors and everything to measure and verify that all of the stresses, the acoustics, the G-forces that the crew will experience as the Atlas V pushes Starliner up into its initial suborbital trajectory are exactly what they predicted those forces and stresses would be and also that the crew um, would be safe experiencing all of those. Uh, the same goes for landing. Um, Rosie's instruments, uh, the, the, the t -t -t test dummy is named Rosie. All of Rosie's instrumentation will verify that on landing, all of the G-forces and stresses and the impact of Starliner when it uh, hits the ground under airbags and parachutes um, are, are verified to be what was expected um, or hopefully better than expected for the crew. Uh, and I say better than expected because actually when they did their paddleboard test in November out at White Sands, which is the same place that uh, the Starliner will be landing at the end of this mission, um, the actual stresses inside the cabin for Starliner on a paddleboard were found to be less than predicted. So they actually designed the system better than what some of their analyses were showing them, um, which is a huge part of doing those physical tests and not just relying on computer modeling. Uh, so that's another major thing that they're going to be looking for. Um, can we zoom in on the crew escape zipline? We sure can from this perspective. Um, let me go ahead and get the camera reconfigured to do that real quick. So um, if we zoom up and in, so if there was ever a need to evacuate the pad from a crew perspective or a, um, or a pad work perspective and they were on that arm, they would run back across that arm to the tower and then on the same level that the tower's on, there are those lines, and you see there are about four of those lines that are going down um, kind of horizontally, but decreasing a little bit. Those are the zip lines, and they will take the crew all the way down, way, 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 way down there, even beyond that little van, um, away to safety, and there is an armored tank um, that would be waiting for them that they could get in that would protect them and allow them to drive very quickly away from the pad uh, and to safety if they ever needed to evacuate the pad that way. It's an MRM. It's a, I'm sorry, uh, Mike Deep is here correcting me on what it is. Say that again. It's an MRAP. An MRAP? Yes. An MRAP. It's apparently apparently saying tank is, uh, is inappropriate, um, as, as I've been told. <laughs> But it's it's a tank. <laughs> yeah, yes, camaraderie. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the zipline system that the crew would use. Um, there are some really cool videos that United Launch Alliance has on their 
um, YouTube channel of United Launch Alliance employees and the um, Starliner crew flight test and um, first post certification crew rotation mission. The crews for those missions actually using the zip lines um, and testing them to get away. So if you want to go take a look at what uh, riding that zip line would be like, uh, you can certainly go do that on YouTube. Uh, unfortunately, United Launch Alliance tells me that they uh, they have no plans to open that as a paying amusement um, park ride for those of us who would really, really, really love to ride the zip lines down from the pad. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't look like that's a possibility. So you'll have to live vicariously through United Launch Alliance on their YouTube videos. Um, what is another question we have? And, and if you've got questions, keep keep putting them up um, in the chat for this YouTube uh, article or uh, for this YouTube video. Again, um, it can be about Starliner. It can be about the Atlas V rocket or United Launch Alliance. It could be about NASA's commercial crew program in general. It can be about the International Space Station. Um, any question you've got, um, while go ahead and put it up in chat. Even if you're nervous about asking the question, please ask. Um, there's there's really no such thing as as a, um, as an inappropriate question if it's about space flight. Um, you know, that's what we're here to, to do. We're here to answer your questions. So if you've got them, go ahead and throw them up in chat. Um, so the next question we've got is, um, what is the launch forecast for tomorrow? Uh, winds sound bad. Are they any problem? Um, so the launch forecast for tomorrow actually shows an 80% chance of favorable and acceptable weather conditions at the time of launch. The main two concerns are any cumulus clouds that might develop offshore and push inland. Um, over the launch pad, um, we do have um, flight rules here that rockets cannot fly through those thick, tall cumulus clouds because there's the potential to trigger lightning as they go through them. Um, the other main concern tomorrow is ground winds, but United Launch Alliance today said that um, even though that is listed as a concern, the current forecast shows that those winds should be well within limits um, for tomorrow. So again, there's always a chance that those forecasts could be wrong, but if the current forecasts bear out, um, we should have some pretty excellent launch conditions tomorrow, including the fact that liftoff is currently scheduled for roughly 30 minutes before sunrise here at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Also, everyone say hello to Nathan, another member of the NSF community, setting cameras as he goes by. Um, uh, launch tomorrow should be about 30 minutes before sunrise, which should be epically perfect for the launch. Um, for those of you who have seen pre-sunrise launches or videos or photos of them, the rocket's contrail will be lit up by the sun as it climbs into daylight when it's still night on the ground. And that plume should jellyfish out and expand in the atmosphere. Um, if you are anywhere in central Florida or southern Georgia or South Carolina along the coast of those two states, you should have, an, and it's clear, you should have an epic view of, of the Atlas V as it launches Starliner um, tomorrow morning. So definitely if you're in Florida or coastal southern Georgia, coastal Georgia, southern Georgia, and coastal South Carolina, go outside and look because it should be an absolutely epically gorgeous display if the skies are clear for you. Um, so that is our weather forecast for tomorrow, for Friday morning's launch. If we should encounter a delay tomorrow and they slip 24 hours into Saturday, the weather forecast does degrade a little bit. Right now it stands at a 70% chance of acceptable weather for a 24 hour delay to Saturday. Um, rain, so ground winds, clouds, and rain become a concern. There is a, ridiculously enough, it is November, it is December, uh, ridiculously enough, there is a tropical low disturbance that is forming in the Gulf of Mexico that will be pulling moisture and energy from the Atlantic across the Florida Peninsula, which will create a lot of weather headaches, um, going forward from Saturday, but the launch should be early enough on Saturday that they hope that we can beat that deteriorating weather um, as, um, as that system does begin to form. Uh, but that's what we're looking at for, um, for tomorrow, for Friday, and for the backup day on Saturday in terms of weather. Um, another question we have, does the NSF media crew have plans to get hot coffee and donuts for the super, super early morning launch? Oh, the answer to that is a very, very firm yes. Um, 
least on the coffee front, um, lots and lots of caffeine and coffee will be necessary uh, for tomorrow. Uh, but for tomorrow as well, like we've done for the past several launches, we will be live from the press site at the Kennedy Space Center starting at 5.30 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow, uh, 10.30 UTC tomorrow um, to bring you the launch of um, to bring you the launch of Starliner to the International Space Station. Um, we plan to do exactly as we've done before, where our cameras on the ground will take you through the, the final hour of the countdown and the launch until we lose track of it, and then we'll switch over to the United Launch Alliance stream, or the NASA stream of the launch. So you'll have one-stop shopping for launch viewing tomorrow with us. You won't have to stop and go elsewhere. Um, but definitely there will be coffee. Definitely there'll be coffee. If any coffee companies out there would wish to sponsor us in our coverage, we are open to that. Um, is Star Another question we've got, another excellent question, is Starliner carrying any cargo on board? And the answer is yes. Um, so while this is an uncrewed test flight, NASA um, is taking full advantage of Starliner's up-mass capability. There is a 500... Oh, I'm going to get the poundage wrong. There, 270 kilograms, whatever that converts to in pounds. Uh, there's 270 kilograms of cargo riding up to the International Space Station tomorrow. The vast majority of that is crew supplies and food and uh, crew and gifts for the crew uh, for the holiday season. Boeing also has a gift for the crew um, to, to thank them for welcoming uh, Starliner to the International Space Station at the start of the partnership between Starliner and the International Space Station program. Uh, Boeing also said this morning that there are um, that there are American flags on board. A uh, one flag one flag for each person who has worked on uh, the Starliner program for them. A lot of Boeing suppliers are also flying little small artifacts and trinkets for their work staff who worked on the various constituent components of Starliner as well. Uh, and then there, of course, there is Rosie, um, the anthropometric test article um, that will be measuring all the stresses and forces that will be imparted onto the crew as well. Um, so technically, Rosie is cargo um, as well. Boeing has also confirmed that there is a zero-G indicator inside of Starliner and that there are cameras inside of Starliner. Um, and uh, data downlink... Permitting, they hope to be able to provide live views from inside of Starliner during launch and when the engines cut off on uh, Centaur and that zero-G indicator indicates that uh, we are um, in zero microgravity at that point. So, um, so yes, but an excellent question. And, and actually, too, even when there's crew on board, Starliner will be capable of carrying... Um, of carrying about 100 kilograms of cargo uh, up and back from the International Space Station, even when there are crew on board. Um, so Starliner, not just a crew vehicle, but also capable of bringing back powered science supplies and um, samples that need to be kept, like biological samples that need to be kept frozen or very, very cold. In fact, on this Starliner um, uncrewed test flight, part of the payload that it's bringing back on December 28th will be biological samples um, that will be packed in it very, very shortly before it leaves the International Space Station. Um, and then they'll be on board Starliner for the four hours that it will take from undocking to touchdown at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. Uh, let's see. Keep the questions coming, guys. These are uh, these are excellent questions. And if you're uh, wherever you're watching from around the world, put that into chat for us. Go ahead, Greg. Go ahead. I've warned him. People are walking in front. <laughs> um, uh, uh, let us know from where around the world you're watching. We, we're a global community here at NASA Space Flight. We love to see where you're watching from uh, and where you're joining us from. So go ahead and throw that. And any question you've got, even if you're joining us on this live stream now and you think maybe my question was already answered, ask it again. We'll answer it again. Because um, you're probably not the only one who, who joined us after we started and, and has that same question. So ask away. Um, so next question that we have... Um, is the flight profile a secret? Has Boeing released any info on it yet? Uh, yes, the flight profile is not a secret. Boeing has um, a few videos out there detailing exactly what the pro flight profile is. Um, 
For Starliner, they've been very vocal about the fact that the Atlas V is flying a much shallower and de depressed trajectory than it normally flies. Um, it has to fly that depressed trajectory for... Um, <laughs> John is just going to smile as he walks on by. Um, uh, that they have to fly that depressed trajectory that's different from all 80 of the other uh, other missions, the previous missions of the Atlas V for crew safety. Because if the Atlas V were actually to fly its standard, very high flight profile, the crew would not be able to survive the abort if, if Starliner had to abort off the top. Um, if, if it were to fly its standard flight profile, either Starliner would be coming back into the atmosphere so steep that the G-force loads imparted on the crew would likely kill them or Starliner would overheat and burn up on re-entry. Um, likewise, during some of the shallower portions of a normal Atlas V flight trajectory, um, the Starliner's angle of entry into the atmosphere would be so shallow that it would actually skip off the atmosphere, resulting in a loss of crew and vehicle scenario as well. So this flight profile is tailor-made to Starliner to make sure that at any point from the moment Atlas V lifts off the pad to all the way to almost 12 minutes after launch when the Centaur engine shut down, um, making sure that at any second in that flight profile, Starliner can abort and the crew is safe uh, and can be recovered safely in the Atlantic. Um, so that, that flight profile is not a secret. Um, actually, our, uh, the, our NASA Space Flight's launch um, launch article is up and live on our site. There should be a link to the description in this chat. If not, go to nasaspaceflight.com. Our launch article actually details what that flight profile is and when all of the major milestones in it occur. Um, and also a bit more of the complex discussion of what that flight profile means in relation to how it uh, impacts the Atlas V's overall performance and efficiency. Um, and it's and a, a good note too is that shallower trajectory actually is why the dual engine Centaur is needed. It's not just that having two engines as opposed to one gives you added redundancy. It does do that in case you lose one of those engines, but it's actually that both engines are needed because of the shortfalls in performance of the first stage of the of the Atlas V uh, because of that shallower trajectory. Um, so, excellent question, but yeah, the flight profile is not a secret for this mission. Um, it, it's out there, nasaspaceflight.com. Click on our Starliner launch preview article, um, and that'll give you all you need to know about that. The video from United Launch Alliance is actually linked in that article, so that article has your one-stop shopping for everything you need or want to know, or maybe didn't want to know, about the flight profile that Atlas is flying tomorrow for this. Um, another question we've got here, why does it say orbital flight test if it's only suborbital? Uh, so good question. So it is an orbital flight test because Starliner will finish putting itself into orbit um, after the Atlas V drops it off on a suborbital flight trajectory. Um, so the first 12 minutes of flight from the Atlas V is what puts Starliner into a 181 by 72 kilometer orbit, and then 31 minutes after launch, Starliner will fire four of its 12 orbital maneuvering and attitude control engines for a 40 second burn to circularize that orbit into a 181 by 181 kilometer orbit. So this is an orbital flight test because Starliner will be orbital. Um, and it will go up to the International Space Station. It will uh, perform an automated rendezvous and docking. It'll stay at the station for about seven days, and then it will undock by itself on the 28th of December and land four hours after undocking in the early morning hours local time at the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. So that's why it's called the orbital. So it is orbital. Um, but that's not actually why it's called the orbital flight test. It's actually called the orbital flight test because there are no people on board. Um, so instead of calling it the uncrewed flight test and then calling the next one the crewed flight test, Boeing thought it would be less confusing. I agree with them to call the uncrewed flight test the orbital flight test. So that way it's very clear that the crew flight test and no one gets confused between the two in terms of which one has people and which one doesn't. Um, that's just Boeing's way of distinguishing the two flights. But it is an actual orbital flight, and it will be up for eight days. Um, another question is, what are the four other towers around 
the Atlas that have the big white, um, the big white things sticking out the top of them. Um, those are the lightning protection towers. So even though we don't need it today and we likely won't need it tomorrow and we all hope for an on-time launch tomorrow, um, these towers are very, very important in Florida summers. Um, and a couple days ago when we had a very intense cold front come through with thunderstorms embedded in it, basically if lightning, if you've got a rocket on the pad, whether it's fueled or not, you don't want lightning hitting it. So uh, you put up these lightning protection towers and the associated wires that they have. There goes Eric again. <laughs> and the associated wires so that the lightning strikes the towers and all of that energy is safely channeled away from the rocket and into the ground where it's safely dispersed. So it protects the rocket when it's on the pad regardless of it's, if it's fueled or not. And that's what those four other towers around the Atlas on the pad are. Uh, again, we won't need them tonight. We hopefully won't need them tomorrow morning. And, uh, and hopefully tomorrow morning we'll have a perfect, picture-perfect liftoff of the Atlas V with Starliner. Now, another thing, we haven't seen this question yet, but um, it's another good point. So um, the other Atlas missions that have launched the Cygnus uncrewed resupply vehicle up to the International Space Station had 30-minute launch windows where they could launch every five minutes in that 30-minute window. Um, that is not the case for Starliner missions. Um, Starliner has an instantaneous single second launch window and tomorrow that window is 06, 36 and 43 seconds Eastern time or 11, 36 and 43 seconds universal time. Um, and it is single second, is it, it is instantaneous. There is no ability to extend the T minus four minute hold beyond what it's currently scheduled for. So any issue tomorrow that results in not being able to launch right at 6.36 and 43 seconds a.m. Eastern time tomorrow will be a scrub. Um, and then whatever that issue might be, if there is a scrub, would determine whether or not they could try again uh, 24 hours later on Saturday or whether they would have to wait until Monday for the next attempt to launch. Um, so that's another big difference with the Atlas V is it is an instantaneous launch, single second launch window tomorrow morning. Uh, those of you who are fans of spaceflight, we're very, um, uh, we are very knowledgeable. We've been through these single second windows before. All of the Soyuz missions to the International Space Station, all of SpaceX missions to the space station have single second launch windows. Um, earlier this week, if you were launch watching the European launch of the Chaos mission, uh, the planet hunting satellite from the European Space Agency on uh, the Soyuz rocket from South America, that also had a single second launch window. Um, so we're very, very familiar with these. Um, and most of the time, everything's good and we don't need to, um, uh, and that's usually not a problem, but it is a difference for the Atlas um, that everyone should be aware of as well. Um, another, again, like guys, if you, again, you know, no matter where you are around the world, if you've got questions, throw them up in the chat here. Uh, my producer is relaying them to me here on the ground. Even if you think your question might have been answered before, if you joined us um, after the live stream started, ask it again. We'll answer it again. Um, that's what I'm here for. Um, also, if you're nervous about asking your question, please don't. Um, no matter what your question is, ask it. Um, uh, we will get it answered for you. Um, it can be about the Atlas V. It can be about Starliner. It can be about United Launch Alliance, the International Space Station. It can be about Russia and their space program. Um, ask away. Ask away. We'll answer it. Um, so next question we've got here, um, has Boeing United Launch Alliance say how much seats will cost NASA? So Boeing and United Launch Alliance have not disclosed the price. However, um, a recently released government um, Office of the Inspector General report stated that seats on Starliner will cost roughly $90 million a seat which is more than the Russian Soyuz um, costs NASA. The Russian Soyuz currently costs NASA about $86 million a seat. Um, the Office of the Inspector General said that Starliner seats will cost about $90 million uh, a piece, that SpaceX seats on the Dragon will cost about $55 million a piece, so significantly less. Boeing has refuted that number and said that that number is not right, but when asked what the number actually is, they have said that it's proprietary and they will not be releasing it. Um, this question was also put to NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine earlier this morning in a media event. He too did not disclose the price, 
of a Boeing seat, but he did seem to sort of passively confirm that it is more than Soyuz. Um, but his answer to that was that he would rather spend more on an American to pay an American company for seats than he would want to pay Russia less for seats on the Soyuz. So that's what we've got. According to the Office of the Inspector General, Starliner seats cost about $90 million a seat. Boeing refutes that but says that the price is proprietary and will not give it out. So that's what we've got on that. Um, does Starliner have any non-pressurized cargo like a trunk? An excellent question. Starliner does not have the capability to take any external cargo to the International Space Station. Um, it can take components that are meant to be outside the space station if they are small enough to fit inside the crew capsule with the crew. Um, but it does not have an external trunk like, uh, like Crew Dragon or like... Um, uh, the Northrop Grumman Cygnus can even um, haul up unpressurized cargo now, although it hasn't yet. NASA hasn't asked them to do that. Uh, but Starliner does not have that capability to take external cargo to the station. Uh, great question there, by the way. Um, next question we've got, um, are you going to watch the launch from here? So <laughs> I wish I could watch the launch from where I am standing. However, I would not be alive after that were done. Um, way too close to survive that from where I am right now. Also, um, I am aimed directly at the flame trench, which would not be good or survivable. You can I've warned him that people are walking in front of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, no, but I will be here at the Kennedy Space Center. I'll be three miles away from the launch pad, uh, the closest they will let us get, um, at the press site at the Kennedy Space Center, right by the famous countdown clock and flagpole. Um, so we will have a crystal clear view of uh, of the rocket on the pad and the launch view tomorrow. So I will be here at the Kennedy Space Center, but not right here where we're currently filming from. Um, Yes, and our live stream for the launch will start at um, 5.30 a.m. Eastern, which is 10.30 UTC. Um, and we will have one-stop shopping for you um, where we'll be live with you from our cameras here on the ground at the Kennedy Space Center from uh, about an hour before liftoff. And if we launch tomorrow, uh, we will have those views from our ground cameras until we lose sight of the Atlas. And then we will switch over to either the NASA or the United Launch Alliance live stream. So you don't have to go anywhere. You will be able to see from an hour before liftoff all the way through Starliner separation on our stream here with uh, NASA Spaceflight. So one-stop shopping that we've got for you once again tomorrow. Uh, again, if you've got questions, keep throwing them up. Again, if you think they've been answered or before, ask them again. We'll answer them again. Um, if you've got questions about Starliner, the Atlas V, United Launch Alliance, Boeing, um, the International Space Station, SLS, Russia, um, Russia Space Program, ask, ask, ask away. Um, so another question that we've got here is, do you know why this Atlas V looks like it's a different color? Um, Interesting. Um, I wonder what the video feed is showing all of you. Um, it is slightly overcast and the rocket is in shadow, um, but uh, it is not a different color from normal. Um, the, the Atlas V booster is gold. The solid rockets are white. The Centaur upper stage is white. Um, uh, nothing about the Atlas V's exterior color has been changed for this mission. Um, so. Um, if you can pinpoint something, whoever asked that question, I'm sorry, names aren't being passed along to me, um, but whoever asked that question, if you can tell us where on the rocket you're seeing a different color than usual, um, we can maybe zoom in on that, um, but, but there's nothing that obvious to me uh, looks any different in United Launch Alliance. I, I asked what differences there were to this Atlas V for Starliner, and um, there's nothing um, on, on the booster itself or, or the rocket that's... Um, that's that's painted differently. Oh, we have 10 more minutes. Um, so we don't have until five. Um, we have until 4.15 apparently. Um, so let's go through the rest of the questions that we've got here. Again, whoever asked that, that question about color, um, if you can pinpoint a specific part on the rocket um, in the next 10 minutes, we'll try and get that answered for you. 
Um, so next question, we came all the way from the United Kingdom. Oh, congratulations, people from the UK are here. Should be a good view. Uh, your question is, will we be able to see the launch clearly from Cocoa Beach? Yes, you will. Um, even if it ends up being overcast, um, if you watch from Cocoa Beach, you'll be able to see it before it goes through the clouds um, tomorrow morning. Um, and there will be no, um, there'll be no question about where you should look. Um, the pad will be completely lit up, so look for the big, bright, white lights on the Cape. And then when those solid rockets ignite, the whole sky will glow orange. Um, so you'll be able to see it and if perfectly, and if it's clear skies or partly cloudy skies, you'll be able to see it for quite a ways as it heads downrange into the northeast toward the International Space Station. Um, and that goes for anyone in Florida, um, southern Georgia, coastal Georgia, south... Okay, and after a minute, now we only have five minutes to get on the bus, so we're going to have to start wrapping this up quickly. I do apologize. We were supposed to be out here until 5 p.m. Um, it's 4.04, um, and apparently 10 minutes turned into five very quickly. Uh, so let's run through the rest of the questions. What fuel does Starliner use on board? Um, I will get back to you on that one because Starliner has a couple of different propellants that it uses um, for its various engines, so I will get back to you on that one. Um, how long has it been since a crewed flight from the Cape? Um, so from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station side, it has been since 1968. Apollo 7 was the last crewed mission that launched from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. After that, all crew missions from the United States launched from the neighboring Kennedy Space Center. The last time a crew launched from the United States was on the 8th of July, 2011, on the STS-135 voyage of the Space Shuttle Atlantis. Um, and that is going to do it from us from the pad, unfortunately. Um, this has been cut short for some reason by an hour, so we have to get back on the bus. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, if you've got any more questions, I am at Chris G underscore NSF on Twitter or at NASA Spaceflight on Twitter. You can send us your questions there, and uh, Chris Bergen or myself will do our best to get those answered for you. Uh, make sure to come back and join us live tomorrow at beginning 5.30 a.m. Eastern, 10.30 UTC for our live stream of the launch of Starliner on its orbital flight test. Uh, check out nasaspaceflight.com. Our launch preview article is up there, as are our forums, which have a lot of other questions and good information for you on Starliner and every single rocket from around the world. Because as I said, we are a global community here. We don't just cover United States rocket launches. We cover rocket launches wherever and whenever they happen from around the world. So check all those resources out. Until tomorrow morning, I'm Chris Gebhardt, Assistant Managing Editor at nasaspaceflight.com. Thank you so much for joining us. here. I think we're good. Wow, that is still loud. Just just turn that camera off real quick. <laughs> okay. Whew. That's so much better. Um, I was actually uh, listening in on that whole thing. Again, I'm back at the studio here. I'm Doss. Uh, we've cut off the camera. Let me tell Chris G that he is clear real quick clear go 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 all right he's good and uh that wind i i it's, it's it's like pristinely quiet now i feel like i need to blow into the microphone or something to get some of the ambiance back again that was chris gebhardt he was outside of space launch complex 41 cape canaveral standing by less than uh 24 hours it's actually down to 14 hours and 28 minutes can i weatherman it yeah it's up in that corner over there uh the countdown clock for the starliner oft test that Orbital flight test for Starliner that's scheduled to go early tomorrow morning. So Chris G is going to be back out there. Uh, we are going to attempt another live stream. Hopefully we don't have winds like that. I know that that especially at the end those winds were getting sort of crazy. Um, did we miss any questions? I know that we were sort of rushed at the end there. It was like an hour, then it was ten minutes, then it was five minutes, and it's time to pack up. And I tell you, I've been out there myself, and you don't want to be the nerd who's like trying to put together the tripod while everybody else is sitting on the bus waiting for you, right? You you look silly. Um, 
but did we miss any other questions? I am. I've got I've got the uh, the questions here. If we missed anything, and uh, much better after cutting Chris's mic. Yeah, Eon Raptor, you're not kidding. Um, oh hey hey Dap dude, how's it going? Um, Again, there's all sorts of stuff going on. You don't have to just finish up everything because the live stream's over here. The stuff that I've got behind me here, again, you can see some stuff on Twitter. This, of course, from the main account, NASA Spaceflight. Chris B. there. Uh, this is actually a video tour that they were able to do of the Starliner factory. So I was going to I was gonna play this video for you right quick. The video is actually available here on this YouTube channel. But let me roll this video and see if I've queued this up correctly, right? I should just be able to go like that. That worked. And then go like that. And go like that. Let's see what we get. I mean, I can talk over it. What you're seeing there is a time lapse of the rollout uh, of the Atlas V going from the VIF, the vertical integration facility, over to the launch pad. And here we have some footage from inside the facility where they actually worked on uh, Starliner. There's a huge American flag. You can see one of the Starliner Starliners there in the background being built. But again, this video is here on the YouTube. You, you don't have to, on this YouTube channel, you don't have to uh, listen to me talk about it. If you just want to watch it, we can link it up in chat over there. <laughs> DJ, play that video. <laughs> But look at that. That's actually really cool. You see all the signatures on the capsule? So all of the people who were involved with, I, th I believe it was the Starliner program, I don't know if it was this specific capsule or the Starliner program, got an opportunity to sign. And on there somewhere, there's one that says, send it. Look, you can actually see, I can point with my mouse, it says, send it right there. Um, so they all signed the uh, capsule. Oops, let's get rid of that there. Yeah, there's some more close-ups again. Again, this was with the uh, National Space Flight Media team. They got an opportunity to tour the facility yesterday. You love the send it, I know, right, Cody? You love the send it. <laughs> there's CST 100 again. Just all so many people involved. I always have to point out there, there are so many people. It's not just the people you see on a stream. It's not just one person who owns a company or anything like that. There's there's hundreds, there's thousands of people behind the scenes who are involved with making these. Uh, these space flights go. So whether it's crewed, whether it's uncrewed, it's not any one person who's the superhero of a program. It comes together because of all those people, and you can see that by the signatures on the capsule. Some gratuitous zoom of a bunch of wiring there. You can tell it's aerospace wiring because it's tied off. It's the same as uh, you see it on fighter jets a lot of the time. And this looks like it's a wiring that's outside of the pressure vessel. You can see that the sort of grid network that creates strength for the capsule, the, the pressure vessel is going to be inside of that, and that wiring that you're seeing there is outside of the pressure vessel. So this is sort of inside the skin of the spacecraft, but outside of the pressure vessel, sort of in the, in the space of the walls of the spacecraft. Also, the only way I know to see how long is left in the video is to hover over it. Okay, not much. <laughs> They are okay for another flight, then you uh, keep them on or take everything off, and then. And even, I mean, not full bunny suit, but somebody in in like I guess level one clean garb or something. I don't know what uh, what you could call that specifically. That looks like a heat shield there, if I'm not wrong. Oh, look at that. So that's the control panel. A big difference between spacecraft here. The uh, Starliner control panel has a lot of buttons and switches. Compare that to I guess you've seen pictures of the Dragon. Uh, crew Dragon spacecraft, it's all touchscreens inside. So let's go ahead and cancel that video. What? There's a picture of a cat, really? Uh, there's also other stuff going on as well. Let's go back over to Present Cam. Um, I've got some more uh, tweets and stuff. This one's from Brady Keniston. Uh, you can see Brady Keniston highlighting the diversity in the new commercial crew program. Uh, earlier today, there was a press conference that was outside the countdown clock, and you have all the astronauts there, including, uh, I can click, you got Sunita Williams in there, Colonel Mike Fink, who else do we have? Excuse me, Nicole Mann was in there, Astro Duke. So great shots from Brady Kiniston there uh, from the press conference this morning. If you go over, you can follow Brady. Every time they're at an event like this, he posts up pictures from the pad and pictures from inside the facility and, and pictures of press conferences, pictures of the launch, and then remote shots and stuff. There's a massive, talented team of uh, NASA space flight photographers and, and media people who are out there getting this content together so that you can check it out. So... I don't think I missed any other questions here. We've sort of run it out just a little bit. So I think what we're going to do is go ahead and shut this down for now. Uh, we'll put some more links in chat. 
check out nasaspaceflight.com. There are articles you want to more, learn more about Starliner, you want to learn more about commercial crew, spaceflight in general. Be sure to follow the channel here. There's like a little, I, I don't know, there's icons and stuff down there that you can click um, if you want to toss a follow or anything like that. We will attempt to be live tomorrow morning. I've got some reports that there may be some uh, bandwidth problems tomorrow morning, but we are going to do our best to get that live stream going. And Chris Gebhardt will be down there at the Cape uh, watching the orbital flight test. Now, it's important. I don't think you want to miss this one because this is one of those launches that happens right before sunrise. So the rocket is not in the sunlight yet, but it launches up and it actually crosses into the sunlight. So you get that big plume effect. Have you seen a jellyfish in the cloud or whatever? That's supposed to happen tomorrow morning, giving the timing of the launch and the timing of sunrise. But again, I'm Doss. That was Chris Gebhardt over at the pad. We're signing off from NASA Space Flight. Thanks for joining the live stream again here. This is a new thing. Appreciate feedback and stuff. Links to the articles. Look at that. Links to the articles over there. We need a hundredth like. Thank you. Yeah, we need a hundredth like. I guess I could click on that. Wait, I can do the hundredth like. Oh, I got the hundred and first like. Whatever. Um, we're going to go ahead and shut it down for now again. Again, y'all, thanks for joining us. We're NASA Space Flight. See you tomorrow for the launch of Starliner OFT.